Hi everybody, I'm Karen Drew in the Local 4 Newsroom here with Dr. Frank McGeorge. We're talking about my story that airs tonight at 11, but I think a lot of people are going to watch this story, share it, comment, because it's about kids, concussions, and football. And the main gist of the story is the fact that we've heard a lot of studies um, done with college, with NFL, on helmets. There hasn't been a lot of studies done on our youth. Who are in football, and I think there was a st statistic like three million kids are in right. youth football right now, and they are getting a lot of concussions, and mm -hmm. apparently they're getting them more from practice than at games. And yeah. Virginia Tech did this study. I was really surprised to find that out. I just assumed it happened more at a game, right? But apparently, these practices. Well, keep in mind, first of all, a game is a very limited period of time. Mm -hmm. There's a ref that's watching and saying, "Hey, bad hit, no d no dice." Right. During practice. There's no ref, there's just a coach, hopefully the coach has some common sense, but you know, during practice, you're trying to push the boundaries, so that may be why it's more common. Of course, you're doing more drills, so you are repetitively hitting your head or running at something, whatever, during a game, you know, again, it's a finite period of time. So, there's a reason that practices tend to be more dangerous in a sense. You might also be a little bit more careless with your protective gear. That's true. I think on a game, I think you're like that. Adrenaline's going, you're suited up more, you, you're expecting maybe a bigger hit right? compared to your teammate, but you're right, you probably aren't as prepared. Right, and so, you know, practices, I think people don't take it quite as seriously. Mm -hmm. That's part of the issue. You know, and there's an interesting statistic, actually. Most um, concussions occur in younger age groups, below hi high school and below, actually, not college and above. And I think some of that also sort of plays into the practice issue, and that's, College and above, it's better regulated. Mm -hmm. Practices, not so much. And high school and below, not so much. I mean, people are a little bit more casual. And, of course, younger kids also have um, more easily injured brains because their their brain is actually filling more of their skull. I mean, as we get older, our brains shrink a little bit. Maybe not in college. <laughs> your brain isn't shrinking so much. But as you age, your brain does shrink. And so kids, they have less room in their heads. And so when they get hit... Their brain slides forward and it gets stopped by their skull, and that's really what causes a concussion is some of that sloshing around inside of the head. And of course, children, they have, um, although they can recover a little bit better, they have, in a way, more sensitive brains. Mm -hmm. So that's part of, you know, part of what we also are worried about. And that's why it's really a big deal in kids, because in you know, teenage, um, high school, and younger types, because it's a higher rate. Mm -hmm. That's where more damage can be done and accumulated more quickly. Are we talking permanent? Potentially. Because I always worry about that. I mean, I, I yeah. think there's a lot of parents out there, and I'd be curious if they're joining us on Facebook Live. Have you decided not to put your child into football because of all this talk about concussions? Or have you changed teams? Or have you had conversations with coaches? So if you are watching or, or making a comment, I really would like to hear from you because I want to know if parents are making different decisions. Because I hear many times as a mm -hmm. parent, I know some of my mom and dad friends have, have made those decisions sure. because they're worried about permanent damage. Well, it can be permanent. Some of that has to do with the sensitivity of the individual, but some of it has to do with the repetitive nature. So one hit, not so bad, may not be permanent, but repetitive hits, especially over short periods of time, can lead to permanent damage. And that's where we really do worry, especially in younger kids, because that can cause longer-term developmental problems, emotional problems, mm -hmm. and really long-term disability. Because basically, if you get injured as a child and you're not able to learn as quickly, for example, mm -hmm. as your classmates, that puts you behind the curve. And that's going to be a long-term thing. And not that I want to upset any football parents, but I've got to wonder, okay, let's say you're considering letting your child join a football team. Mm -hmm. Is there an age where you need to say to the coach, I don't want any tackling? Is that okay? Is that possible? I mean, what if there's, yeah, right. I mean, can you do that at age six? Or, I don't know or, if that's possible given I mean, the I know nature that sounds, of football. I'm a mom. I mean, you know, well, <laughs> I, I mean, don't mean technically, yeah. but maybe certain types at practice or limiting. Right. I don't know. Well, How do you do that at a certain age? I think that makes sense. And I think if you could do that, that would be perfect. Yeah. But I don't know that that's practical given the way football is played in America. Right. Now, you know, and, and we're focusing on football, but I, you know, I think it's important to point out there's soccer. plenty of other, yeah, I have soccer, so, hockey, yeah. there's plenty of other sports where kids get whacked in the head from all kinds of, you know, all kinds of forces, and they're all, I don't want to say equally as dangerous as football, because football is, I think, a little bit worse, but they all have their inherent risk of head injury, and you do have to be very conscious of it. 
And I've also noticed, too, on some teams, especially soccer teams, I've heard, you know, that some coaches do try to limit yeah. practicing with the head and mm -hmm. trying to play a different game if you can, right. not using your head as much as back in the day when we did, because I thought that was... Right. A great move, but I could do it. I wasn't that good. <laughs> well, you know, I think anytime, you know, if you just, it's just sort of a common sense thing. If you're repetitively hitting your head hard, that's bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know that, you know, it doesn't, I don't think we need a lot of science to support sure. that or back that up. But, you know, the fact is, actually, the even the nature of the definition of concussions has changed over time. It used to be, you know, when I was when I was in medical school, for example, we would routinely say, if you did not lose consciousness, you did not have a concussion. Okay. That has actually evolved over time in our understanding that concussion now is, is more than losing consciousness. That is, you do not have to lose consciousness to sustain enough injury that it could be called a concussion. We know this from all kinds of other brain imaging that a concussion involves not only physical damage to the brain but chemical changes in the brain that are much more subtle. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's just a brief period of confusion. You got your bell rung without mm -hmm. actually losing consciousness. Sometimes it's confusion, sometimes it's just bad headache. Those are evidence of brain injury, which mm -hmm. we really basically have translated now into the word concussion. Do you see in the ER younger people coming in with concussions than you used to? Mm. I don't know that it's that that's really changed in the sense that the threshold to bring someone to the ER usually, especially after a sporting event, is usually a coach call. Mm -hmm. And coaches generally don't send kids in unless they think there's something that really needs to be checked out. So I'm not sure that's really changed that much. Now, if it's the parent that is concerned, yeah, there's probably been an increase in parental concern. But most of the time it is for something fairly significant that we need to evaluate. You know, because really the way you evaluate a concussion is, you know, talking to the, the person, see what kinds of symptoms they're having, do a quick physical exam, make sure they can do some normal neurologic things, mm -hmm. that their speech is normal, that they can, you know, move their arms and legs normally with good coordination. But beyond that, really, the main thing is psychomotor testing. So that's why we encourage everyone that plays sports especially, but really in general, get a baseline of your reflexes, get a baseline of how quickly you can do certain types of computational problems. Then, if you injure your head, especially, again, if you're in sports, we can check you to see whether your reflexes are as good, to see whether your ability to do computations are as good, and we know whether there's actually been a functional injury. Where That's, do you get a baseline test like that? Do you have to go to a doctor for an official... No, actually, you know, a lot of schools, and, and you can find them online as well, mm -hmm. but a lot of schools are able to administer these, you know, they're called psychometric tests, but they're basically tests that measure your ability to perform with your mind quickly. Mm -hmm. And so that way, if we establish a baseline and then we repeat it after you're injured, we know that you have had a functional decline as opposed to looking for a physical injury in the brain. Because sometimes, you know, people, parents, actually parents come in pretty often and they say, my kid got hit in the head, they need a CAT scan. And the truth is, when we examine them, they don't need a CAT scan. They don't need an MRI, but they do need to be followed up. They should undergo some testing. But the majority of concussions being diagnosed these days are not physical, that is, things that you can diagnose on CAT scan or MRI, but they are subtle psychological things that you would find on psychometric testing. Okay. Changes in reflexes, changes in thought processing, changes in your ability to do math problems or that kind of thing. And again, everybody's different, so you but have to establish that baseline. That's good to know, I would think if I was a mom and my kid got hit hard, I would be... I want an MRI, I want a CAT scan, right. but that's not necessarily the best test to ask for. Correct. And okay. it's not, it's, it's first of all not usually necessary, right. and it certainly is not necessarily the best test. That is, most of the time those tests are going to be normal anyway. Now there are times when they are necessary, so you should ask if you're worried. But if you've been, or your child has been evaluated, and we don't think a CAT scan or an MRI, but really CAT scan is kind of the first mm -hmm. line, is necessary. That's actually an important thing because really you don't want to expose your child to unnecessary radiation. You don't right. want to have to, you know, go, I mean, there's a lot more to the CAT scan than just laying them down on a CAT scanner right. and getting it done. So you want to limit it to when it's necessary. When it's necessary, absolutely do it. But there's a lot of times when, frankly, we evaluate the person and we say, no, this is something where it can be basically treated as an outpatient. We do testing on them. We follow them up. We do a lot of conservative management. That is, you know, no contact sports for a while. So you're out of the game for a while if you knock What's your head banging up. Well, okay, so that's, 
Actually, right. That's a very interesting point because that is not super well defined. It partly depends on how bad the injury was. So, for example, if you have a head injury and you lose consciousness, you're going to be out for a lot longer than if you just, quote, got your bell rung and were just confused or a little mm -hmm. dazed for 20 seconds. But in general, a good rule of thumb is going to be about a week. Okay. If it's, you know, if you lost consciousness, it could be as long as a month. That depends on your symptoms. So, for example, if you have ongoing headaches, nausea, some dizziness, confusion, your baseline testing, that psychometric testing we're talking about, was off, and it hasn't returned to normal, that's probably not a good time to go back in the game. Right. Because if you get hit again, chances are you are more sensitive to another concussion, you are more sensitive to cumulative injury, and you are... Basically, clearly, just not doing yourself yeah. any favors. I do want to know if anyone's on Facebook that is commenting, let us know. Ken. Yeah, we're getting a lot. Of, we have about 50 comments so far. Uh, a lot of parents saying that they they won't let their kids play contact sports. Huh. Uh, some saying that uh, keeping these kids involved in sports, there are more positives than negatives, and um, they're having fun and they're just kind and of. And it's true. It's kind of like we yeah we all you know we always say we don't want to make our kids wimpy or right. bubble wrap well, our kids when we do get that. And I do agree that you know sports and activity is really important. But I guess the question is the degree. So for example, if your kid's not going to grow up to be a pro football player, they're not going for a football scholarship. Mm -hmm. Why put them in a game playing full bore, smashing their head against other players all the time? I guess for my money, I would say, enjoy the sport, but maybe limit the, the amount of times you knock your head. Right. Unless, like I said, you're going for a football scholarship. Not that that's a good reason to get a concussion either. But there is sort of a, there's a common sense line that I think parents have to draw knowing. There, there is a risk. Yes. Point blank, exactly. there is a risk. And there's a risk in soccer, too. We've got a lot of people commenting. Don't forget about the people playing soccer because they deal with that as well. I do want to know if any of our Facebook friends are watching. If they have had a child with a concussion, what did they decide to do? Did they let them yeah. heal? Did they put them back in the sport? Did they put them back in the sport in a limited way? So please, we do want to hear from you. Um, this isn't just a one-time story. We, we, it's been in the news for quite some time. Oh, yeah. But I do think this Virginia Tech study is interesting that it really did focus on the youth. Right. And we do put a lot of attention on the college players and the NFL players. Mm -hmm. And if you happen to be just joining us, we're talking about concussions in our younger kids that there hasn't been a lot of study done, especially right. with their kind of helmets and right. they put an accelerometer, yeah. and they measured. And it, like you said, the brain has not as much space. Right. Is that it why gets, it... So, yeah, so, you know, you can think of it as, you know, your brain is, you know, if this is your skull and this is your brain, your a child's brain is tighter up against there than, uh, you know, an older adult's brain where there's a little bit more, well, mm -hmm. fluid basically around right. your brain. So, you know, in a child, when that, when you stop suddenly, your brain is going, and it gets squished. It gets hit up against the skull on the inside or twisted. And that's, you know, the accelerometers that are in helmets, that's what it's measuring. It's measuring that force. Mm -hmm. And so those kinds of studies help us understand better not only how to protect our children, but what maybe what the limits should be. Mm -hmm. Because that's part of what I think we're beginning to wrap our heads around. Now that we understand that concussions are not just a loss of consciousness, that concussions can be much more subtle, now we need to figure out where does damage start to occur, where is their real injury, and then maybe change the game or modify the rules so that we can limit the amount of injury and still let people have fun and enjoy the sport. Because it is interesting, like we said, and also I want to hear from people, if if their coaches are coaching different or if their coaches are doing anything different in practice, we have, we, we yeah, focus we just got a We just got a comment team. from uh, Ryan that says, my son plays and the coaches teach the heads-up method of tackling. Yep, that's exactly what we're talking about tonight at 11. Um, a lot of people saying, you know what, some of this is up to the coaches to teach the correct way of, right. of tackling and playing and and, and, that, and, and up to get these kids in the right equipment that they need to be in. Yeah. Right, and I think you're right, the heads-up approach is very popular now, but a lot of times parents don't know. Like, I know I'm not a huge football sure. person. My husband would know more, but, you know, if you're a mom who doesn't know, you might not know to ask, are you teaching this way right. or are you coaching this way? Right. So I don't know. Well, you know, in the habits, they do start early. So it's important that, you know, coaches, especially in younger, you know, in younger kids and, and even into high school, teach appropriate techniques so that kids do limit the amount of injury because mm -hmm. those habits start early. Yeah. And if you can avoid bad habits and limit the injury, you're going to have a better long-term playing career if that's your choice. Right. Or you're frankly just going to be able to enjoy the sport longer as a player. 
than if you get injured. And you know, and honestly, you know, we focus a lot on head injuries, but I got to tell you, I see all kinds of injuries in sports. Sports carry inherent risk. And so, you know, it's balancing the risk and the reward with the sport. And I do think it's important for kids to go out there and enjoy it. But there is a certain amount of basically accepted or implied risk. There is no sport, uh, or especially contact sports, field sports, that is 100% safe. Mm -hmm. You're going to injure, you're going to have a certain number of injuries. We just want to limit, reduce the injuries as much as possible by adopting safe practices and good rules, good coaching, good refing, mm -hmm. so that we limit the amount of injuries. Because really, long term, we're talking about our kids, which are our future. All right. Well, Doc, we appreciate it. We yeah. really do. We also appreciate all of your comments. Again, we'll have more tonight. Um, and we'll also post my story on clickondetroit.com, also on Facebook, so you can catch it out. So we'll be talking about uh, the new ways of studying youth football, concussions, uh, the heads-up approach, and also some of the things they're avoiding in practice. I want to hear from you. Has your coach done anything different? Has your child suffered from a concussion? And what are you doing different as a parent? So thanks so much for watching and joining us, and hope you all have a good day.